So welcome to all of you. My name is Alfred Spector. Um, I'm a head of research at Google, and I do some other things as well. In particular, I've met some of you that have been part of our intern program, and that's something that I have the great pleasure of uh, leading within Google. Uh, I've had a diverse background, like many of us, doing a bunch of different things, but I was an academic for a while, and I've been in business and an entrepreneur, et cetera. In this section, in this session, we're going to talk about a few things. Uh, first, we're going to talk about our approach to research and engineering, because I think it's something which is, it should be of interest to you at Google I.O., because I think it's the thing that will keep us on the cutting edge and really keep the kind of sessions that you heard about, say, in the keynotes yesterday morning going. Um, second, um, I want to just talk a little bit about how we relate to the world of research and innovation outside of Google. Uh, most of you are part of that world, and you're essential uh, to what we're trying to do. Third thing is, as a panel, um, we'll talk about kind of things that are of interest to us, what we're working on, and what are our views of the future. At the end, um, let me just mention it now, there will be a survey. Please fill it out. We are requested by the powers that be to ask you to do that, and we would indeed like you to do it. On the panel, and you can see in front, um, on your right is Thad Starner, who is at Google and also a professor of computing at Georgia Tech. Um, he is the TLM, the technical lead manager of Google Glass. So you can imagine kinds of things that he'll be interested in talking with you about, computer vision, virtual reality, machine learning, image and video, and the like. Um, Next to Thad, uh, in the gray shirt, is Peter Norvig, who is our director of research here in Mountain View. Um, he headed search quality at Google at one time in the very early days of Google. He's an acknowledged leader in artificial intelligence, has written the, co-written the most popular book. Also, he created with um, Sebastian Thrun the AI course, which got MOOCs going. How many of you took uh, Peter's AI course in the room? So you all know Peter very well, or not all of you, but. Ah, Peter recognizes you all, yes, indeed. Um, and then um, on the, your left is Jeff Dean, who's a Google fellow, has been at Google for quite a while, uh, was involved in the earliest days of implementing our advertising systems, and has been really a pillar of strength and of creativity in creating the distributed computing infrastructure at Google. Uh, with Sanjay Gemawat, they invented uh, MapReduce, and uh, he's a member of the National Academy of Engineering, and recently Sanjay and Jeff won the ACM Infosys Foundation Software Systems Award. I think that was the research systems innovation of the decade 2000 to 2010. Uh, that's my view, and we can hear about what Jeff is currently working on. MapReduce 2 or 3, or I don't know. We'll find out uh, when he talks. So just to start, as I think about research at Google, the, the most interesting thing for me is that if we think of the Google mission statement to organize the world's information and make it universally accessible and useful, it's basically a candy store for computer scientists and related disciplines, statistics and mathematics and related aspects of engineering and the like. Um, there's so many problems in our field that are included within that in understanding, in building very large scale systems, in security and user experience, dot, dot, dot. So virtually every problem in the field is subsumed within that mission statement, and we get to go work on it. So that's sort of the really fun part of being at Google. The second thing that I think makes Google research interesting is that we blur the boundaries between research and engineering. And why is that? Why don't we believe that we should have some number of people sort of isolated in a room somewhere, a very nice room maybe, thinking great thoughts, inventing the future, and then we'll go tell the engineers what to go do. Uh, we don't believe that for a number of reasons. Um, one reason is that building systems, building large-scale systems, requires every bit as much creativity as a new idea on how to go do something. So there isn't a differential in terms of creativity in terms of hard work, intelligence, et cetera, oftentimes in building something in a way that's really valuable and useful and in thinking of the idea. Um, a second reason, I think, is that our field, computer science, uh, and of course the engineering related fields as well, is increasingly an engineering discipline, not just a mathematical discipline, and also increasingly a field which is empirical. 
So our field initially, if you think about it, go back to the earliest days, it was very significantly mathematical. The work of Turing, mathematician really, um, a lot of von Neumann's work was mathematical. There was ever increasing engineering as we built fancier and fancier hardware devices and software stacks and the like. So engineering became a big part of the field. And then in the last 10 to 20 years, really since the advent of machine learning, it's become an empirical discipline which means access to large-scale data, lots of usage, and large scale is really important to the field. So now there's a tripod under the field. So if you separate research from all of the data and usage, you skip a lot of the engineering, and particularly, you skip the empirical nature of the field. So we think you can't do that, and that has motivated our kind of blur the boundaries between research and engineering approach. Uh, uh, Slav Petrov, Peter Norvig, and I wrote a paper in the communications of the ACM last summer called Google's hybrid approach to research where we made these arguments sort of as clearly as we know how. So what it leads to is a situation where we, we organize what I would say opportunistically in whatever way makes the most sense to accomplish something. So sometimes it makes sense we have a very goal-driven effort that's product-driven like say Google Glass. There's an awful lot of research that's needed in that in order to make that really work right, but it makes sense to let that go off and do its thing. Google X does that, and to think about it as part of a goal-directed activity to produce Google Glass. Um, sometimes it's a technology-based effort. Sometimes we don't have a specific goal. We want to improve a technology. And sometimes we do that in conjunction with existing systems when we want to improve, say, recommendation algorithms in, in, uh, in something that we're doing. Uh, or it may be something that's new. We have a better way of doing OCR, and we think we do, and we have a separate team that's separate from the engineering team to a large degree, because we think we have a better approach to optical character recognition. So we organize in whatever way makes sense, and we all work for the same company, and there's an enormous amount of fluidity. Part of the reason it works is that we treat engineering with enormous respect across the whole business, as I said earlier, and we feel that our engineering team is like enormously talented and capable of whatever classes of challenges that we have, whether invention of new things or the last, or, or, uh, or making things work. Last thing I would say about Google research, and to those of you that are researchers, I hope, hope this isn't problematic, um, we view that good research is defined by impact, not by publication. So publication is a part of impact. A good publication is extremely important. So we certainly endorse that. So we endorse peer-reviewed publications that are cited by lots of people that change the nature of the field. It's an excellent way of information dissemination. But in this day and age, unlike the day and age of, say, Sir Isaac Newton and the Royal Society when this started, it's a different world. There are other ways of disseminating information. So open source, I would argue that the Android open source release or the Chromium open source release are fantastically valuable publications, which teach an enormous amount to the world. Um, indeed, uh, standards are publications that codify the best practices, and they're also, of course, extremely useful. And indeed, our products and other people's products also are forms of publication and engineering discipline because they push the state of the art. And they declare a new state of the art, and usually people sort of understand why they work, and that indeed sets a new level underneath the field. So we all motiv try, to, try to achieve impact, and we measure ourselves based on impact, inclusive of papers, but other things as well. By no means do we do everything ourselves. Um, we strongly support and work with universities on a regular basis. It's not coincidental that, I mean, it's, it would be, it's not like the only person that feels he's part of a university as well being at Google with Thad here. There are many people that have lots of university ties in one way, shape, or form uh, at Google. We fund uh, about a couple hundred uh, research grants a year at universities. We have uh, you know, one to 2,000 technical interns at Google every summer from universities, uh, and we fund fellowships around the world. It's really important to us that the university community be really healthy uh, inventing new things and of course training lots of students. Um, the open source world is also extremely important to us. So we are um, large supporters of open source. Large amounts of the code that we use are based on it and we contribute large amounts of code to the open source world. One of our most innovative programs there combines education and open source. It's the Summer of Code program. Any of you know about this, Google Summer of Code? 
So there we support large numbers, usually of fairly young students in the summer, uh, 1,000 to 1,500, that work on open source projects. And we think it's a good way to contribute to their education and to keep that community uh, going along uh, as well. And of course, then there's the developer ecosystem. Developers are doing, in many ways, the most advanced work uh, with platforms and technologies that Google has. And we recognize the enormous value that you engender for our users uh, and that reflects on what we do as well. All in all, the track record's been pretty good. We've done a lot of innovative things. A lot of what you heard about yesterday morning in terms of being able to combine information and to do valuable things in speech recognition and natural language processing and understanding, all those things come out of research projects initially uh, at Google and elsewhere. Um, if you look at the uh, image, all the beautiful image processing that's done, the sort of automation and image processing, that's image processing work that is grounded in some of the best research that we know, and I could go on, but I'd be talking too long then. So what I would like to do is to come down, join the panel for a while while they talk about some things that are on their mind, and then we'll take questions, all right? So, um, Jeff, why don't you go first? What's on your mind? Uh, sure, so, uh, is this on? Can you hear me? Could we get it on? Okay. Um, so uh, I guess I'll just tell you what I've been working on most recently. Uh, I've been working on a large-scale distributed machine learning system that essentially is trying to use biologically inspired um, neural networks to d solve a number of difficult problems in speech recognition, uh, uh, vision, computer vision, and uh, natural language processing. Um, essentially, the idea is that you take large amounts of data and you try to automatically infer higher and higher levels of abstraction um, rather than hand engineering features and then trying to do kind of fairly shallow machine learning kinds of techniques. Instead, we start with the raw data and uh, by using very large amounts of data and computational power, we can have the system automatically learn what are important patterns to extract out of data. Uh, there was a New York Times article about some of our vision work on automatically recognizing cats. I don't know how many of you saw that, but uh, essentially um, the idea is we never told the system what a cat was and we built a system where at least one of the neurons in the system was uh, very selective for whether or not it contained a cat. Uh, that's not that useful in and of itself, but uh, it turns out the vision system that you can build when you pre-train it with this kind of thing is actually quite state of the art. And we've also been applying this to speech recognition. So We've been collaborating with the speech team to deploy uh, acoustic uh, deep neural nets as acoustic, the acoustic modeling portion of our speech recognition system that's given very significant reductions in word error rate. Uh, and then we're looking at interesting uh, representations of text where you represent words in very high dimensional spaces so that similar words are sort of close together in a thousand dimensional space or something. And that seems like a pretty important and powerful uh, way of uh, reasoning about text. Okay. Okay. Uh, my uh, main efforts lately have been in online education. Uh, we built a uh, open source system for creating classes. We just had the fourth release uh, last week. But I won't say anything more about that because right after this session and in this room, uh, I'm going to talk about it in another session. So s stick in your seats if you want to hear about that. Instead, I'll uh, talk about something just because uh, yesterday I was talking with one of the team members who was so excited that they had their launch uh, here at I.O. of the uh, music recommendation system. And this, in, in some ways, is, is similar to the type of thing uh, Jeff was talking about, that it's a machine learning system. And uh, I think it's, it's maybe the main point isn't that it was music, uh, because we didn't really have that many experts on music. We have people who like music. Uh, but the exciting thing is that we have a process for, uh, for doing that type of learning. So we start and say, well, well what do we have? Well, we've got the uh, raw files. Uh, they've got sound waves. We've got the Fourier transform of those sound waves, and that gives us some input. Then we have the metadata. We have uh, what's the title, the artist, and so on, the genre of the music that's uh, sort of associated with, it, with that track. Then we have the meta metadata of what's everything that's been written on the web about those artists. Uh, and then we have the social data of uh, people who like this one also like that one. And from that, 
And from the processes that we've built up, saying we know how to gather a lot of data, we know how to store it, we know how to process it in a distributed fashion, and we know some uh, mechanisms for building machine learning systems, we were able to come up with something. And, and, and I've been pretty happy with it. You know, I've uh, been playing with it and comparing it to other recommendation systems. Uh, and for me, it does better. Maybe I like weird kinds of music. Uh, but it does a great job, and it's just a, a, a demonstration of how far you can get by applying this methodology of learning from data. So I'll tell you guys what I'm most passionate about right now. Um, let me ask a question of the audience. How many of you actually know sign language, or a little bit of sign language? Wow, very good. Anybody good enough to actually translate what I'm saying? No? Okay. Yeah. Um, so 95% of deaf children are born to hearing parents, and most of those hearing parents will never learn sign language well enough to teach it to their children. What happens is you, you as an infant, you actually gain short-term memory. You learn short-term memory through the process of learning language. And so the deaf children I work with get neither access to English, because they can't hear, nor sign language, because their parents don't uh, learn sign, until they get to kindergarten. And that means that while you and I might be able to remember five digits, like say four, five, one, five, six, the children I work with can remember two digits. And that affects them for the rest of their life most often. It's a barrier for education, it's a barrier for jobs, it's a barrier for life. So what we're trying to do is create applications that help parents of hearing, uh, hearing parents of deaf infants learn how to sign. We have an application you'll see coming out later on on Android uh, on the Play. Uh, that is called Smart Sign. It allows parents to get lessons in little micro interactions throughout the day where they'll get a new sign that is shown to them on their cell phone. Uh, right now, I have a sign linguist who works with me at Georgia Tech. He's betting that's going to be even better with glass. He wants to have pop, pop up little sign language lessons throughout your day, depending on what context you're in. Um, you also, if you are, are working with an older child and you don't know what sign uh, that you uh, need, you can actually say, okay, Glass, what is the sign for horse? And it shows it to you in your eyepiece. And so that way you can actually use the sign while you're in conversation with your child. Another thing we're doing is making a game that helps these ch deaf children uh, acquire language skills. And we're actually using computer vision to track the hands and actually uh, verify that they're signing the right thing to progress in the game. That's called Copycat. If you go to YouTube and look for my name and Copycat and Smart Sign, you'll find these applications. And hopefully what we can do is actually get these things out there, get them publicly available so that more hearing parents can more easily learn sign language and more of these deaf children can actually acquire the memory span, the, the word span that we would like to see uh, in their normal education. Great. I'm going to go up and act as moderator in a minute, but before I do that, I'll just mention one thing that's been on my mind, and even a bet with one of the senior vice presidents that I have on this. And one of the questions is, to what extent do we really have all the tools today to do extremely deep artificial intelligence? So the question that I think about a lot is, we have the knowledge graph, we have the ability to parse natural language, we have neural network technology, we have enormous opportunities to gain feedback from users as to whether things that we do are right, pleasing, or not right, or not pleasing. If we combine all of these things together with humans in the loop continuing providing, continually providing feedback, do our systems become to really an, an all-way intelligent? Is that sufficient? And you could call that the combination hypothesis, something I have been doing, calling it for a decade that as we combine all of these different things together, different technologies that years ago AI people would have thought and said, that's not important, we don't need that, we'll just do this. I think we need them all, and if we do them all, will that yield what we want? We'll be able to take an image and write a textual explanation of what that image is about, not just there's a face and there's the Empire State Building and whatever, but can we describe what we humans would say about that image? Can we, when we do a summarization of a paragraph, can we not just be sort of heuristically clever and pull out a few subjects and objects, but can we really get the right tenor of it? Can we actually get the negations correctly, et cetera? It's a good question. Um, it'll be very interesting to see how far we go. What I feel today about that is we have an enormous amount of runway to push this. So I think the kinds of demonstrations you saw in the morning when you talk to your machine and it tells you things you want to know, I think they're going to go really far. But how far, we don't know. I think. 
And I think that's one of the really interesting open questions that we, and I hope all of you in the research world are looking at as well. So let me turn to uh, a different role here and I will play uh, moderator as best as I can. <clears throat> all right. Um, what's the distinction between research within the research group and research in the rest of the company? Peter, why don't you take that one here? You've been doing research and being in the company and everything for longer than I have. Yeah, uh, I guess we try not to make a, a big distinction. We do have a separate research group, uh, but the, uh, whether you're in research or in engineering is more driven by what uh, area you're working on than by sort of how researchy you are and whether you were a professor or uh, how many papers you want to write and those kinds of things. So uh, when I was running uh, search quality, that was uh, in the engineering organization, and so everybody I hired was an engineer. And it didn't matter how many PhDs they had. Uh, if you're working on an engineering project, you're an engineer. If you're doing something that we aren't doing yet, uh, then we can call you a research scientist. I think that uh, probably answers that one. I'm gonna click yes. Uh, Google is, um, well, where can we read and or learn about current non-secret Google research projects? <laughs> non-secret, well that's good. So if they're secret, I think we knew the answer to that. Uh, Jeff, do you wanna try that one? Uh, sure, so um, on research.google.com, there's actually a link to uh, recent publications uh, that people have made and categorized into a whole bunch of different areas. Uh, so that's one, one way. Um, uh, People at Google often give external talks that are videotaped, so you can find those on the web about, you know, sort of less fully developed work that's not quite ready for publication. Um, and, you know, I think going to conferences is another good way. We often publish papers there, uh, chat with people informally at, at conferences. Sort of the normal way that the research community um, collaborates. Right, and indeed there is a G plus uh, Google research uh, group that you can subscribe to. And uh, that's also something that, research at Google is what it's called, I believe, right? So you should subscribe to that as well, and I think you'll see a lot of what we're doing uh, there. Uh, let's see, the next question is, um, Google is uh, hard to approach externally, both for figuring out who is working on a specific problem and for knowing what you're getting into when you apply for a job. How should academics form successful interactions with Google? Hmm. All the team members here are looking at me on this one. I guess I don't get to delegate this one here. So uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a fine question. I mean, we are, we are either happily or regrettably a big company. Um, Lou Gerstner once said, every little company wants to be big and every big company wants to be little. And there's some truth in that statement. So it'd be nice if we were little and then you'd know who to talk to because there are only 10 of us. Uh, I think that the, the best approach is actually to find someone you know at Google and talk to them. I'm guessing that most of you know somebody at the, at the company, and I would try to vector through them uh, to find someone. I think this is still a personal world. We're all humans, we talk, we send email and chat and such things. I think that's, a, that's really a very good approach uh, for doing things. Uh, but then you could also uh, vector off of, uh, of the various uh, things that we have on our websites and find out from there. So I think that's probably the best approach. Maybe we need to build a system for this or something like this, I, I don't know. Uh, all right, let's see. Um, is a PhD degree a must for joining, uh, for doing, let me say for doing research at Google? Can external people contribute some way even without joining the team? Anyone wanna take that one? Yeah, I guess I could take it. Uh, so, so I think a PhD is indicative of the kind of person that we like to hire. Uh, a person who's shown that they have a passionate interest and that they can carry through work over the period of many years and come up with something successful. And so uh, getting a PhD is a good way to demonstrate you're that kind of person. But if you can demonstrate it some other way, that's just as good. We, uh, we don't really care uh, if you have the degree, we care what type of person you are. Right, absolutely. Um, I'll add to that. Great. Again, as Zephyr was saying, you know, there's not much distinction between engineering and research, and oftentimes some of the best research is people transitioning from engineering into doing uh, something with the research teams, and, and they can come from any level of background. It's more about being able to do the work and having the intellectual curiosity and discipline to do it. I'll even add something. Uh, one thing I find, even in my own work, is that I go through cycles of 
working on a very exploratory thing where I'm doing more research. And then as that sort of comes to fruition, hopefully I'll bring it closer to actually building a real product out of it. And that sort of shifts what I do to more of an engineering thing where I know what needs to be done. And then when that's sort of at a good spot, then I go back and find some more researchy thing to do. And so even an individual people kind of cycle through this continuum. Right. Can external people contribute some way even without joining the team? Uh, the answer is we have quite a few collaborations going on externally uh, with folks. Um, it often works well when open source platforms are the basis because then intellectual property issues don't get in the way, but there's an awful lot of that at Google. We do an awful lot in the open source community. So uh, I think so. When there's you know, deep IP involved, then that's always challenging and there's just, I'm afraid, no way around it. Uh, but, but we do, in fact, collaborate with thousands and thousands of people through our open source platforms uh, and uh, that either we lead on or that others uh, lead on and that we contribute to. All right, who is our Steve Jobs? Uh, and uh, who picks who, uh, this looks like, uh, who picks who singular picks the big ideas or is it distributed? Jeff, you want to try that one? Or maybe everyone should answer that. Sure, I mean, I mean, I think it's a combination of things. One is a lot of times new ideas come from someone just tinkering on their own and exploring some new thing they think Google should be uh, doing and that we're not currently. And a lot of times those sort of prototypes or ideas become full-fledged projects that really push the company forward in some area. And other times, um, you know, Larry or Sergey will say, why aren't we doing this? And then that will sort of form a team. It's, it's a combination of these things. And, you know, great new ideas come from all over. So it's not like we wait until Larry says we should do this. Uh, but if he does say that, he's often right, and you should pay attention. <laughs> I think generally our strength is, is actually that, it's, that we're distributed to a large extent. Certainly, and you heard Larry yesterday, he's encouraging big things. So we are uh, possessing a CEO now, and with Eric as well, that has encouraged really significant results uh, that benefit lots and lots of users in the world. So he's always done that. He's always pushed for discontinuities. So that's a big role that he plays. Uh, but Larry can't do everything himself. He'd be the first to tell you that. So he depends on many of us to have good ideas and to come up with things that we want to go do. And uh, some of them, you know, some of, some of them uh, arise, as, as, uh, as Jeff said, sort of naturally from an existing project. Uh, that's, I would say, probably the most common thing that happens is something sort of just sort of obvious to do next when you're doing a project. And a lot of what we do is undoubtedly based on that. All right. Uh, last year, Google's CFO mentioned at an innovation conference in Montreal is uh, that Google's mantra is to make sure each project is capable of affecting one million people. How do we balance this reach with research and revenue generation? <laughs> well, uh, so I, I think some things start small and grow, and I think that's the answer. So, and we don't always know which ones will do that. So we certainly desire of, are desirous of doing things that are truly impactful. And we're a big company, so our standards are, are high. But we don't really know which ones are going to do that. So we start some things that don't work, um, and, and we don't know. Um, there, there are numerous efforts that I'm involved in, some you see, some you don't see. And, and we don't know if they'll work, which is the nature of engineering and research. You, you don't know. Right? You must see that in the glass world. There's oh, some yeah. things I mean, you try and don't. One of the things is there's so, much, so many niche things you can do with wearable computers that you know, aren't gonna affect a million people. Um, they could be $100 million businesses, but they're not the big win you expect. And you try to make the product such that other people can go out and do that. You try to enable it, not close any doors. And you try and make it sure, sure that you know, the academics who are interested in accessibility can do what they want with, their, with the device. People who are interested in industrial things like repair and inspection and maintenance, that they can do what they want with the device. Try not to shut anybody out. Um, but it also allows people to really explore quickly, uh, grow quickly, and see you know, where the big hits are going to be, you know, not just at Google, but you know, out in the world in general. Are there people that would like to come up to a microphone live? 
Um, we have audio recognition capabilities here on stage <laughs> and can deal with that. So if anyone would like to come up, feel free. Um, you can make your way to a microphone while we're doing the next question. Could you go to the mic, please? Because we'd love to hear your question. Like, uh, my question is, uh, in those days, you know, there was one professor by name Vishweshwaraya. He converted the energy, water energy, into the productive energy. So how, why can't Google use the energy which is generated in the Bermuda Triangle to some constructive energy? <laughs> so I'm sorry, so why can't we use the energy related generated to the- in the Bermuda Triangle near the Atlantic Ocean, you know, and use it for some constructive energy. Because those ideas are now- I'll take that. Okay, fine, all right. <laughs> Um, so one of my specialties is energy harvesting, um, particularly for mobile devices. But uh, it turns out that trying to gather environmental energy, especially for things like uh, uh, ocean power, that sort of stuff, you can do things like PVDF staves, that sort of stuff, but it's very hard to do that at any sort of scalable level. Um, if you're interested in that, go check out something from, called Ocean Engineering. It's a little company in the little town I grew up where they actually are looking at these sorts of uh, things about generating power from the ocean. Another Hi. question, yes. My name is Loretta Cheeks. I'm a PhD at ASU in uh, CS. Uh -huh. My, I have two questions. The gentleman on the end, the glass. Are you thinking about um, making the glass accessible to the autism community, autism community, to, or anyone who need independent living uh, capabilities? Because it would be a big help, as for a lot of reasons. Uh, and the next question, do you have a tool that's comparable to Wicca uh, that will allow you to do some of the feature extractions and data mining type of things? So I'll, I can take both of those because these guys don't know what I'm working on in this space. Um, so uh, this is another example where uh, uh, we're trying to specifically keep glass open for people who, can, who work in these spaces. A good a friend of mine at Georgia Tech, Gregory Abowd, um, uh, works very much in the autism, and, and we're doing, we're reaching out to academics right now with Glass uh, to try to give them early access to the device and to some of the, the inner guts so they can actually use it for these particular things. And you'll see Gregory using it not to do this in the future. Um, and now as far as the feature uh, extraction, so Weka is really great for when you have, say, you're comparing two images together. One of my specialties is in um, uh, time sequences. And we're doing something called pattern discovery. Uh, one of the things we're looking right at right now is looking at bird song and trying to pull out, pull out the fundamental units of bird song. We're looking at dolphin vocalizations, trying to pull out the fundamental uh, uh, parts of dolphin vocalizations. It's very hard to do, but um, you can see some of that in, our, in a PhD thesis by David Minnan that you can download and take a look at. And that's for time varying signals. And that looks for things that are um, uh, repeated uh, and you try to explain time by these what's called motifs. And if you're interested in that, come talk to me later. It's one of the things that we're very much interested in. As a matter of fact, it's why I got into wearable computing in the first place. I'm trying, and this is something that I should tell Alfred about. One of the reasons I started wearable computing was I really wanted to make a computer that sees as we see, hears as we hear, track the motions of our hands, and discovers our, the activities of our daily lives, learns to string those together in the sort of scripts and frames standpoint, and actually learns what it is to be human not right. just you know, what is to, to um, um, describe a particular image, but actually the meaning of it in the human world. With that. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, let me add to that. Uh, we, we do have a service called the Prediction APIs, where uh, you, you ship us your data, and we run a suite of algorithms over it, and we send back classifications or regressions over that. That's a cloud service you can find. If you type Prediction API Google or something like that, you'll see how to use it. And it's, um, it's meant to be quite easy to use. It's just as Peter said, you give it some data, you give it some examples, we train, and then off you go. All right, let's see. I think in the back was the first question. Uh, you, you, yes, you, you, sir, sorry, in the blue shirt. Kia ora. Um, my company works with education, so we, we get to see, I'm, I'm privileged to see every day the impact, the tools that you build the work that you do has on students, on parents, uh, globally. And I think it's quite profound um, how we, the tools you build enable social change. I'm curious whether at Google Research you look at the impact of social change and what it means, for example, for things like collaborative consumption. 
I'm, I don't actually know that. Does everyone know the word collaborative consumption? I don't know that term. So could you define that for us? Um, I'm not sure it's probably experts in the room. Short, briefly, yes. Briefly. Um, the idea is that a lot of the tools we build, particularly in Silicon Valley, are geared at consumption. Collaborative consumption is about building things like communal gardens. It's about ways of using resources we already have uh, in a way that's shared. Um, okay, got it. Autonomous cars, great example. Uh, so the way I would put that is I think the, the group that's most interested in topics like that is Google.org's engineering team which is extremely interested in how we can use technology to be a lever to improve uh, governance, participation in democracy, uh, to try to uh, create uh, greater transparency in government, uh, to make energy consumption um, more efficient, uh, to allow for grids to be uh, more effectively uh, managed and utilized and, and the like. So I think those would be the places where we are doing work that's most related to that in google.org, so you could check, check into that. Thank you. Yes, sir, in the orange or red. Hi there, uh, Peter from Toronto. Uh, it strikes me that um, if any team is capable of bringing Skynet online, it's this team. <laughs> <laughs> my, my actual question is, how often do ethical debates arise in decision making? <laughs> First conversation I had with Sergey. Right. Uh, this is this is you know for, for um, you know I've been doing wearable computing for 20 years, part of my daily life, and one of the first things we did is said, okay, here are the things that are probably going to happen, and um, let's build out slowly. Let's have small communities using this so we can actually get familiar with the what the how these devices can be used in a socially appropriate manner, and then let's build it out larger and larger and, and scale these things. And so I think it's I think it comes up routinely within Google from what I've seen. We were able to get down from Asimov's three laws to uh, one law, don't be evil. Uh, <laughs> but it is a constant struggle to uh, try to interpret that and say, you know, if we make a move in one direction, are the, uh, what, are the outcomes going to be good or not? And, it's, uh, and to do that, you have to uh, look ahead uh, many steps, and, uh, and we keep trying to do a better job of that. Thank you. I think we try to just, just for, for, in my thinking, there's an enormous amount of distribution of thinking about those issues throughout Google. So it's not that, you know, there's a group of ethicists somewhere that rule on things. I think all of us as engineers and scientists in Google think deeply about what are the consequences, pro and con, of what we might do? How can we mitigate the con and maximize the pro? And just, just speaking as a, as a member of the National Academy of Engineering, those of you who are engineers, we should all do that. It should be part and parcel of our code of ethics as engineers, that we, we do no harm. Thank you. Uh, my name is Vijay. Um, so my question is, um, so it used to be that uh, Google presented search results and relevancy in, uh, irregardless of the individual, right? And now there's a sense that relevancy depends on who is asking for it. Um, so the way I look at like the current way of thinking about the knowledge graph and trying to assess semantics from like the broader amount of information, that's sort of done at the moment, or my impression is done irregardless of the person. And I'm wondering like on the research team, like, like what the philosophy is behind the balance of how semantics are determined based on the individual as opposed to like the entire corpus. If, I don't know sure. if that makes sense or. Yeah, I, I can take this one. Uh, I mean, I think, Really, you do want personalized results because if you know, for example, that I like spicy food and I query for restaurants in some new town, it should bias those results to my interests. And so there's a bit of a tension between how much do you, do you weigh those personal interests for some new query you've done or some new information need and what sort of the general populace thinks. And you know, I think there's a variety of different levels at which you do this. You can adjust things based on the language someone speaks. You can adjust it based on the country they're in. You can adjust it based on their current location uh, at a very fine grain level. Are they standing in downtown Palo Alto or in San Francisco? That could affect things quite significantly. Mm -hmm. And so it's a constant, uh, uh, ten not, not really tension, but you're, you're really trying to balance all these different factors. and. A lot of it is data-driven, so you try to understand when you want to, 
weigh certain uh, personalized factors much more than, than in other circumstances. So is, is that balance something that more has to be tweaked or can that itself also come? Do you that can like also be machine yeah. learned. So yeah, yeah. you can do a lot of machine learning on um, the kinds of actions people take. Like did we, you know, we do a lot of kind of online testing of different kinds of algorithmic okay. uh, changes and look at those sorts of And then in terms effects. like a Okay, semantic. but we have to, we'll oh, okay, have to yeah, move sorry, on. Just one. So I'm going to do a bunch of questions very quickly and then we'll move this because we're running down to the last four minutes and I think we need to stay on schedule here. Um, it says that in some, one question is we do open source in some projects and publish papers. Is there a rule of thumb for what we release as open source and what remains proprietary code? I would say there is not a rule of thumb, but something that does guide us in the release of code is that there's some things that are just very difficult to release. So it would have been very difficult. To we, we thought about release, releasing our MapReduce software. We really thought deeply, particularly when Hadoop was coming out, but it was so intertwined for reasons of optimization with the rest of our stack that it was actually very difficult to, to consider doing. So we didn't do it. So I would say there's no rule of thumb. The difference between research at, and X X has tended to focus on a collection of topics that are not things that the rest of Google is already doing. So that's the differentiation between X and other innovation that's been going on at Google. That's a rule of thumb. I can't say it's hard and fast, but that's my impression of what the differences are, and I think it's generally right. Last question here that I had is, does research develop end user products uh, or prototypes? And the answer is yes. Okay, now we can take the two questions if we want back there. We do both. Um, go ahead, you need to find a mic. We, we can take, I didn't mean to dismiss the two folks that had stood so long. I apologize for that. Name's Frank from uh, Florida. We've come so far in the last five, 10 years. What's your thoughts on where we'll be 10 years from now in this industry? What do you see computers, software doing? In 30 seconds each, guys. <laughs> uh, I think. I think we're making real progress on perceptual problems. So things like speech recognition and vision are showing dramatic improvements over the last few years. And I think that's going to continue because we sort of have a handle on what the right approaches are and we just need to scale them up and make them work better. And that's really going to change a lot in terms of how you interact with the computers or computing devices. You know, I think they're going to kind of vanish into much smaller devices that you carry around and aren't sort of big full-size laptops that you kind of interact with. Peter. Yeah, I would agree with that. I, I think uh, we're, we're getting uh, more contextualized. Uh, the computer is not something that you go to to use. It, it's something that's uh, around you uh, all the time and uh, sort of more integrated into your life rather than being a separate thing. Okay, I'll play the mad scientist. Um, I believe that we are currently living in the singularity, to borrow Vinovinji's term, and I believe that we'll see that where the tool stops and the mind begins, we'll start becoming blurry. Um, we'll be able to start thinking with our tools in new ways we haven't been able to think before. Okay, last question I think I can take in blue. I'm sorry. Sure. We're happy to answer the next one privately after the talk. No yes, sir. So we've seen some recent announcements, announcements on Google's involvement with quantum computing. And I'd be interested to hear the viewpoint on the classes of algorithms, uh, the problems that can be solved, and the usefulness of that to Google in the future. Well, so I think no one really knows exactly whether where all this is going to go. I, I don't think I don't think we truly know, but it's gotten to the point where it definitely uh, may very well be interesting. There may be classes of programs that this D-Wave architecture uh, actually is is plausibly good at solving, relating to say image and such things. So we're trying to learn. We're trying to also push the future. Uh, we want to contribute not just to technologies that are sort of ripe for harvesting tomorrow, but in some cases uh, for the ones that will be important in the longer term. Yeah, I think it's still pretty early. Yeah. All right, I guess we're going to get the last question because you're... Is there any kind of research going on combining glass technology with Kinect technology where like person in front of you like doing like sign language and then like it spits out like your language saying like where like there is a, like some kind of like translator in so, between where it, uh, I think I can't comment on any of that, those sorts of things. So why don't we, we'll try to handle it separately. <laughs> Come on up. So look, let me just remind you all if you could please fill out the form. Um, I don't know how to get it here for you, but if you go and uh, do something here, you can find the form. Why don't you get that here? And uh, we thank you for coming.
there's going to be big changes in education. Stay around and hear about that. That's my two cents. Thanks, guys.